I would like to welcome every. So are there people listening be, beyond the panelists? All right, very good. Um, uh, my name is Douglas Kreese and welcome to our panel on uh, <clears throat> uh, developments among Straussians studying medieval political philosophy. Everyone knows that Leo Strauss was profoundly influenced by and indebted to medieval political philosophy. But most of those interested in Strauss don't specialize in aspects of mid, in, or they do specialize in aspects of political philosophy other than medieval political philosophy. So the goal of our session this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are, is to enable the non-medievalists to grasp recent developments among Straussians working in the larger area of medieval political philosophy generally. To this end, we have three papers. Uh, the first will be given by Rasul Namasi, who teaches at Duke Kunshan University in China, but I believe right now is in Germany. Uh, he will speak to uh, Strauss's writings in the Islamic uh, context. Second will be Joshua Perens of the University of Dallas, who will speak of Strauss's work in medieval political philosophy in the Jewish context. And then I myself will give a paper on the Christian context. We will have two discussions. Those will be uh, uh, by Karen Talia Farrow of uh, Arizona State University and Mary Keyes of the University of Notre Dame. Uh, so, uh, Rasul, um, please begin. Uh, thank you so much, Doc. Um, now, um, first of all, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers, obviously, for making uh, this event possible and also discussions for taking the time to read and give feedback on this paper. Uh, I'm happy that we finally managed to gather together and have this discussion, which was not obvious for well-known reasons. Um, the subject of my talk is the negative reception of Leo Strauss's writings on Islamic political thought. Uh, first, I would like to begin by explaining why we should pay attention to this question at all. I will next explain my own interest in this subject. Finally, one prominent example of these negative reactions to Strauss's writings on this subject will be discussed. Now, first of all, why this question is important at all. It has been known at least for the past couple of decades that Islamic political philosophy played an essential role in Strauss's intellectual biography. In other words, Islamic political philosophy was not a side issue or a marginal aspect of Strauss's thought, but one of its key components. Now, let me illustrate this by three points. First, in a letter to Eric Foglin, one of his uh, one of his correspondents, Strauss mentions that Arabic political philosophy was for some time his, quote, a speciality, unquote. So as one can see here, the importance of Islamic political philosophy for Strauss is not something that um, scholars had to argue for, um, but something that Strauss himself was very much aware of. The second point, also of biographical character mainly, is that Strauss collaborated with several influential scholars of Islamic philosophy. I can mention three figures in this regard. First, E.I.J. Rosenthal, an influential figure of Islamic studies, who confessed his debt to Strauss in uh, his studies on Muslim figures. Second is, uh, was Paul Krauss, Strauss's brother-in-law, and one of the most original scholars of Islamic philosophy who had a decisive impact on the whole field. Uh, Krauss's impact is sometimes forgotten by other scholars because of his uh, early and tragic death, um, but Strauss was collaborating with, with Krauss, editing and translating al his writings before uh, Krauss passed away. Now, the third person that I would like to mention was uh, Mohsen Mahdi, Strauss's student for a, for a while, who became a prominent scholar of Islamic political philosophy. So Strauss was in contact with all these uh, influential and important figures. Third point that shows the importance of Islamic philosophy for Strauss is of more theoretical character. Strauss is often described, as you all know, as a Platonic thinker. 
who considered the recovery of thought and writings of Plato of utmost importance. Now, as one can easily see, I believe, Plato's thought, which Strauss emphatically advocated, is not the common Platonism of scholarship, but a highly political and unique form of Platonism. I can even say that Strauss's Platonism is fundamentally formed by the thought and writings of Muslim philosophers, a Platonism seen through the lens of people like Al-Farabi, Avicenna, Averroes, and so on. So for these reasons, I believe it is necessary to pay attention to this aspect of Strauss's thought. Now, let me also say why I personally find this aspect of Strauss's thought of particular importance. I've been working on Strauss's unpublished writings uh, for, a, for a few years now, following obviously the footsteps of other scholars who have been editing Strauss's unpublished writings for much longer than me, by the way. Uh, when I began working on Strauss's papers, I found two specific and fascinating typescripts on Islamic thought. One on Arabian Nights, which is about 18 pages long, and one on Averroes' commentary on Plato's Republic, which is about 14 pages long. Now, considering the fact that these two typescripts were a series of detailed notes written in shorthand and in very enigmatic and elusive style, I decided to publish them along with interpretative commentaries. Now, to do this, I had to obviously to look at what was already written on Strauss's contribution to the study of Islamic political philosophy. It was then that I observed a curious phenomenon for the absolute majority of scholars working on Islamic political thought. Strauss never wrote anything on the subject. They simply didn't refer to Strauss at all and entirely ignored his writings on Muslim figures. There were a few exceptions to this rule who could be divided into two main groups. Few people who paid attention to Strauss's writings on Islamic political philosophy had a very positive appreciation of his thought. But these were mostly directly or indirectly students of Strauss or were uh, influenced by, by his writings. The second group considers, consisted of few people who referred to Strauss's writings on this subject without being influenced by his scholarship. They made very short remarks about Strauss, which were highly critical and dismissive. Now, let me concentrate on one specific example. Example is Dimitri Kutas. Now, among the most influential detractors of Strauss's writings on Islamic critical thought, Dimitri Kutas occupied directly or indirectly in a very influential article by Kutas. It is therefore helpful, uh, even necessary to approach this influential piece uh, titled The Study of Arabic Philosophy in the 20th Century, published in 2002. Now, Kutas's article begins with an interesting question, I believe. What is the reason for the relative lack of interest in Islamic philosophy? among historians of philosophy in general and scholars of Arabic and Islamic studies in particular. In Gutas's view, this neglect finds its principal source in historians of Arabic philosophy themselves, because these people, these historians of Arabic philosophy, have failed to present the subject properly to their colleagues. They have failed the discipline by pursuing three approaches in their studies which Kutas finds objectionable. These three approaches are described as first orientalist, second mystical, and third political by Kutas. Kutas has dedicated his whole article to the discussion of what is wrong with these methodological perspectives. As for the orientalist approach, Kutas seems to believe that it has no prominent representative in contemporary scholarship. But the Orientalist approach occupies a prominent place in Kutas's article because it turns out that its mistaken ideas are still living inside other common approaches, including political approach that Kutas attributes to Strauss and his followers. In fact, political approach and mystical approach are described by Kutas as contemporary reincarnations of Orientalism. Now, in order to provide um, a more concrete overview of Kutas's claims and also to limit myself to the time at my disposal here, 
Um, I concentrate on three main points in Gutas's article. First, Gutas claims that Strauss subscribes to the Orientalist view according to which Islamic philosophy is invariably about the conflict between religion and philosophy. Gutas claims that according to Strauss and his followers, all of Arabic philosophy is about this conflict. Now, is Gutas's claim true? It is doubtful. A large part of Strauss's writings was indeed focused on the conflict between religion and philosophy, a topic deeply important to Strauss's intellectual pursuits. Nevertheless, Strauss and his followers never claimed that all Islamic philosophy is about this conflict. One can even claim that such a general judgment attributed to Strauss by Gutas about the intellectual production of hundreds, if not thousands of thinkers in any period of civilization would be absurd. Strauss never claimed that and Gutas adduces no evidence that he ever did. Gutas has to use such categorical language invariably, all of, etc., etc., because his claim would become completely moot if he had said it in more qualified terms. Interestingly, even he himself, Gutas, in his article, admits that the relationship between religion and philosophy has been important to some Muslim thinkers, although he attempts to downplay its importance. The fact that two of the greatest figures of Islamic philosophy, Al-Ghazali and Averroes, were so interested in this issue that they wrote two major treaties about it proves this question un of undeniable importance. In any case, this does not mean that all Muslim philosophers were only concerned with this topic throughout history. It would be absurd to claim that they were. This conflict was particularly important to Strauss because of his own intellectual preoccupations. In the same way that all so scholars have peculiar interests, Strauss prefer certain subjects and focus on them while neglecting other subjects and issues. Focusing on this issue is not a sign of Strauss's Orientalism or anti-Islamism, just as Strauss's interest in the same issue among Jewish and European thinkers does not demonstrate anti-Semitism or anti-Christian prejudices in his thought. Additionally, contrary to Gutas's assertions, Strauss does not agree with the biased Orientalist attitude that philosophy could not thrive in Islam because of its intrinsically anti-rationalist nature of the latter. The charge is actually quite unbelievable. If Strauss truly believed that philosophy cannot thrive in Islam, there would, be, there would not have been a Straussian approach to the study of Islamic philosophy, obviously. Now, the second point in Gutas's article, which concerns our uh, subject today, is Gutas's claim that according to Strauss, all Arabic philosophy, again, until Averroes, is seen as having a political framework. The view which Gutas argues, argues is based on a very flimsy evidence. Again, Strauss did not claim that all Arabic philosophy has a political framework whether it was before or after Averroes. He is more interested in how Al-Farabi portrayed philosophy in a political context, as well as how his vision of prophecy was passed along to Avicenna and Maimonides. This is a very nuanced and rather limited claim that can be true or false, but to attribute a much, lar a much larger claim about all the Islamic philosophy to Strauss is false. Now, the third point relevant to our discussion, again, is this. In his paper, Gutas, pre Gutas presents a diagnostic of the study of Islamic philosophy and attempts to enhance the appeal of Islamic philosophy to scholars of other fields. However, it does not appear his solution is the right one. Gutas is concerned that the scholars of other disciplines who are philosophically minded studying the works of Corban, Strauss, and their followers, may find Islamic philosophy philosophically insignificant. According to Gutas, his own approach will not result in the same effect, but would rather establish a reputation for Muslim philosophers as serious thinkers. The facts, however, do not support Gutas's claim. 
Strauss's approach stands out from others, including Butas's own, because he approaches philosophers' writings with the utmost seriousness. Unlike many scholars who are exclusively obsessed with antiquarian de details like the availability of Greek works to Muslim philosophers, in Strauss's studies, the writings of Muslim philosophers are read in a way that cannot be compared with the way they are read by other scholars. Strauss's approach was based on a fundamental principle. The students of medieval philosophy should not look down on the author on the discussion and must start with the healthy presumption that the philosopher studied by the historian of philosophy is a man by far superior in intelligence, imagination, and subtlety. Philosophically, this perspective is superior to the approach advocated by other historians of Islamic philosophy who are consistently prejudiced against the access of Islamic philosophers to original texts and continuously underestimate the philosopher by assuming intermediary sources and misunderstanding of Greek texts. A good example of this approach is Guthas's own article where he claims Straussians are conducting their research as if the Arabic philosophers had recourse to the same Greek texts of Aristotle and Plato as ours, without regard to what Guthas describes as historical and philological factors which condition the Arabic philosophers' understanding of the Greek philosophical tradition. In this regard, Guthas mentions translators' misunderstandings, faulty manuscripts, and similar problems in the translations available to Muslim philosophers, problems accumulated, according to Guthas, over the 12 centuries that separate classical Greek philosophy and the beginning of Arabic philosophy. Guthas follows a similar model in, um, in his very critical review of Joshua Parents' book, and then in an essay where Guthas claims that Al-Farabi's summary of Plato's laws is not actually best based on Plato's laws, but probably on a lost Arabic translation of Galen's synopsis of Plato's laws. It is crucial to be reminded of the fact that Guthas's hypothesis is at odds with Al-Farabi's own explicit claim that he has read Plato's laws. Furthermore, Guthas's hypothesis implies that Al-Farabi was so incompetent and ignorant of Plato's dialogues and writings that he could not tell the difference between actual Platonic writing and a summary of it. Is this hypothesis evidence of Al-Farabi's philosophic worth? Similarly, Guthas, in another strongly critical review of Charles Butterworth, claims that any discussion of Averroes' commentaries on Aristotle's politics must take into account the decisive influence which the garbled Arabic translation of the poetics and earlier Arabic commentaries had on Averroes' understanding of the text. Following Guthas's point of view, Averroes' commentaries would appear to lose their philosophic value too. Islamic philosophers' reputation as profound thinkers does not seem to be supported by such claims. Now, uh, Guthas's enterprise of reducing the study of Islamic philosophy only to editing manuscripts, uh, pointing to the real or imaginary poor understanding of Greek originals on the part of Muslim thinkers, and of explaining, explaining everything by establishing lines of influence is much more suggestive, actually, of Orientalist prejudices than Strauss's. Guthas, Guthas reduces Islamic philosophy to mere appendix of Hellenistic philosophy, whereas Strauss regards the philosopher as thinkers on the same level as Plato and Aristotle. Now, this, uh, this was all I had to say on this occasion. Thank you for your patience and looking forward to hearing your comments. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. For, well, that was excellent. Um, <clears throat> the second paper uh, is by Joshua Parent. Well, hello. Uh, I will apologize in advance. I know it's not a good thing to begin with apologies, but my paper is not as much on the secondary literature as the other papers, and I apologize for that. Um, 
1963, Leo Strauss introduced Shlomo Penis's English translation of Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed to the English-speaking world. Before that, other translations existed, but they were quite loose in the manner of Cornford's translations of Plato. As had Jews for centuries, Strauss had been puzzling over Maimonides since at least the 1930s. And his publications since then had spurred renewed interest in many quarters, especially among specialists in medieval philosophy. Why exactly Leo Strauss, the political philosopher though, was so interested in Maimonides was not readily apparent. Of course, that Maimonides exemplified the esoteric writing style about which Strauss had been causing a stir at least since his 1952 persecution in the art of writing is obvious. But why is Maimonides relevant for students of political philosophy? That Al-Farabi, in whose thought the centrality of political philosophy is obvious, was deeply influential on Maimonides, helped explain the interest some. Yet to this day, Maimonides has not garnered the kind of interest he warrants from political philosophers because he appears to be more interested in matters metaphysical. Despite his collaboration with Strauss in 1963, Pines published in 1979 his article, Limitations of Human Knowledge, according to Al-Farabi, Ibn Baja, and Maimonides. This article has shaped much of the scholarship on Maimonides since 1980. The basic argument is that Maimonides holds a view of metaphysics like that of Kant. For that reason, like Kant, he treats the human end as primarily practical. As Pinus puts it, quote, uh, our highest end is, quote, political happiness, end quote. Although this analysis of Maimonides was not embraced by many interpreters, it sparked many reactions and continues to shape discussion of Maimonides to this day. It gave rise primarily to two responses. Either that Maimonides, despite acknowledging some limits of knowledge, still holds that through theoretical philosophy or metaphysics is our highest end, or that Maimonides, as Pina suggests, ponders the limits long and hard, is something of a skeptic, but is less interested in political happiness than upholding a Jewish way of life for the individual. The former view is by far the most widespread, and I, for that reason, I don't even give examples in the secondary literature. There are just too many to mention. And the latter view has been most clearly articulated by Joseph Stern. In the meantime, uh, neither Penis's hyper-political view of Maimonides nor either of these reactions to his accounts gets at the heart of Strauss's interpretation of Maimonides. On the contrary, the overall effect of Penis's article was to drive most scholars more deeply into metaphysical or Jewish philosophical readings of the guide. I have myself published and republished with some modification, one piece arguing that Penis is wrong regarding the rigidity of the limits of knowledge, in effect, attempting to bolster a bit the metaphysical reading. Well, the metaphysical focus of most readings since uh, Penis's 1979 piece has not enamored Maimonides to Straussians. The gap remains between political philosophy and this metaphysical focus. I hope that many in my audience suspect that Strauss would have more valuable things to say about Maimonides than Penis. In the rest of this brief paper, I will seek to answer the question, what then does Maimonides' guide have to do with political philosophy, according to Strauss? The best way to address this question is to consider his 1935 philosophy and law and his 1941 literary character of the guide for the perplexed, because I believe it is here that he moved from a more to a less traditional view of Maimonides. Although the former remains invaluable, it is the latter in which he first comes fully into his mature understanding of Maimonides. One way to put it is that philosophy and law still remains under the influence of Strauss's neo-Kantian training. Literary character has broken free of that anachronistic way of reading Maimonides. What I mean by this contrast will become apparent, apparent momentarily. Even in philosophy and law, Strauss hints at his future direction by writing chapter two on the legal foundation of philosophy and chapter three on the philosophic foundation of law. 
The relation of law and philosophy foreshadows his mature formulations about the city and man, with law representing the city and philosophy representing man. Here we already have inklings of the theologico-political problem. What makes this neo-Kantian, however, is his talk of the foundation. The search for the foundations of the sciences has been a focus from as early as Descartes, but surely the determination that one might find such foundations became an even more pressing matter in late 19th and early 20th century German thought because of the enormous progress of the empirical sciences of the past three centuries. These sciences almost seemed to have taken on a life of their own with little or no reference to the whole of knowledge or even of knowledge of the whole. But surely Maimonides lived in a different time, a time when the unity of the sciences was hardly a pressing question. As Strauss would go on to show in literary character, Maimonides thought not in terms of a philosophic foundation of the law, but in terms of the defense of the law or Judaism. Foundation smacks of a rational ground. Defense smacks more of art. This is not by chance. Since writing Philosophy and Law, Strauss had come to understand that as a student of Al-Farabi, Maimonides thought of the sciences in light of the distinction between jurisprudence and kalam or dialectical theology, not in terms of Christianity's view of theology as the queen of the sciences. In other words, by the time of literary character, the quote, sociological significance of the primacy of law in Judaism and Islam had impressed itself on Strauss. And there that use sociological, it's a term that he uses in persecution in the art of writing in the introduction. Um, and literary character, of course, appears in persecution. Philosophy and law was extremely ambition, ambit ambitious. There on the first page, Strauss claimed that Maimonides is, quote, rationalism is the true natural standard, the standard to be carefully protected from any distortion, and thus the stumbling block on which modern rationalism falls, end quote. The heavy emphasis on his rationalism was surely intended to command as large an audience as possible among those who still considered rationalism worth supporting. Comparison, comparisons seem to be encouraged not only with Spinoza, but also as far back as Descartes and as recent as Kant. Persecution in the Art of Writing, in which literary character appeared as chapter three and, the, uh, and as the first of three long substantive chapters, along with the most elusive law of reason in the Kuzari and the most readily accessible how to study Spinoza's theological political treatise could hardly be more different and in tone and spirit from philosophy and law. That has surely struck many readers as odd that Strauss's key work on esotericism, persecution and the art of writing appears to be a Jewish book, especially given that its title chapter, Persecution and the Art of Writing, does not emphasize the merely Jewish character of esotericism. Indeed, persecution as a whole has led some readers to think that esotericism is primarily a Jewish and Muslim phenomenon, as opposed to say a Greek one. Yet the Jewish character of all the authors explored at length, Maimonides, Judah, Halevi, and Spinoza, and the demanding of obscurity of at least his piece on Judah Halevi underlines the less scientific air of the book. Strauss wants us to begin less with visions of rationalism than in the spirit in which Maimonides presented himself, that is, as the great defender of Judaism. Within the opening pages of literary character, we learn not about a quasi-modern scientific foundation of law, but of the enlightened kalam of Maimonides on the model of Al-Farabi used to defend Judaism. This is what Strauss takes Maimonides to be referring to when in the introduction to part one of the guide, he refers to the true science of the law. In his footnote, Strauss refers the reader to Al-Farabi's enumeration of the sciences, chapter five. There, Al-Farabi gives a portrait of an apologetic art that defends the law from all comers. Although he doesn't state it very directly, 
he alludes to the non-rational tools used by these dialectical theologians. This kalam is what Strauss refers to in literary character as imaginative. Maimonides in Guide Part 1, Chapter 71 makes it explicit that the traditional kalam or imaginative kalam opposed philosophy. And Maimonides claims to share their intention, at least so far as it concerns defending the law. Here we see tensions break out that were nowhere in evidence in philosophy and law. Indeed, in philosophy and law, Strauss started with the legal foundation of philosophy. And through the nice symmetry of these two foundations, he seemed to insinuate that the legal foundation of philosophy was complementary to the philosophical foundation of law. As my friend and colleague Joe McFarlane once noted to me, he was struck in reading philosophy and law the chapter two on the legal foundation of philosophy used as its leading example, not Maimonides' guide, but of Verowees' decisive treatise. Given that philosophy and law was devoted ultimately to the understanding of Maimonides, it's noteworthy that Strauss considers what he sees in the guide to be a less striking example of the, quote, legal foundation of philosophy than in Averroes. Evidently, the legal foundation of philosophy was not as central to the guide as the philosophic foundation of law, or to put it as persecution does, the defense of Judaism. And when I say central, I simply mean that which appears really most directly and foremost. In literary character, Strauss certainly never references legal foundation of philosophy, but more importantly, he says little, if anything, explicit in literary character about the defense of philosophy. Indeed, the most noteworthy contrast between philosophy and law and literary character is that the latter drops not only the references to foundation, but also, and more importantly, Strauss places far greater emphasis on the Jewish character of the guide than in philosophy and law. So much so that, by the way, re recently I heard a scholar refer to uh, the guide through Strauss's lens and literary character as a parochially Jewish work. Right? That's sort of the, the initial impression given by literary character. That Strauss is silent in literary character about the foundation or defense of philosophy in the guide should not be supposed to mean that he rejects the traces of the legal foundation of philosophy that he claimed to detect in the guide in philosophy and law. Instead, this squares with Strauss's strong insistence that the guide has been misunderstood because it has been thought to be a work of Jewish, Jewish philosophy, much as, as Gilson, excuse me, would refer to Aquinas' thought as Christian philosophy. It's necessary to take Maimonides' presentation of the guide as a defense of Judaism with the utmost seriousness as Strauss does in literary character. Almost in the same breath as he denies that Jew and philosopher are compatible in the introduction to persecution and the art of writing, though not in literary character itself. He goes on to confirm that Maimonides, like Averroes, needed much more urgently a legal justification of philosophy than did their Christian counterparts. So here he gives us a pretty clear indication in the introduction that even though in literary character he emphasizes the defense of the law, here he reminds us, no, well, actually there is also a defense of philosophy in the guide. The question then arises, how can one provide both a defense of Judaism and the defense of philosophy in one work, given that the initial impetus to defend Judaism was against philosophy? We have shown today that, uh, uh, that what were presented as complementary in philosophy and law reappear in literary character as at loggerheads. As it happens, what Penis highlighted as central for understanding Maimonides namely the limits of knowledge will prove indispensable in determining how these two opposing aims can be achieved in Maimonides' guide. That is, the limits of knowledge can be used to defend both law and philosophy. Those limits cut both ways. These differences between philosophy and law and literary character in persecution in the art of writing reveal not only that literary character is more Jewish, Jewish, 
but also that is more political than philosophy and law. How can a work called literary character be more political than a work called philosophy and law? In City and Man, Strauss, cl Strauss claims that how to read Plato as a literary question is the problem of City and Man, or as he puts it there, the problem of society and philosophy. Of course, Strauss presents persecution, persecution in the art writing as providing materials for a future sociology of philosophy, not a sociology of Judaism. The relationship of city and man or society and philosophy is of course Strauss's central issue, namely the theological political problem. In literary character, Strauss revealed for the first time the necessity of attending to the surface of the work. Inattention to the surface bars one from the depths. Although natural right and history is far more widely known, persecution contains more of Strauss's most shocking universal insights about city and man, despite its apparently parochial character. If and when readers are able to attend to the surface of Maimonides' guide with greater care, they will come to see, as Strauss did, that the guide is in fact a work of political philosophy rather than a work of Jewish philosophy. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much. That was very rich. Um, the title of my own paper is Developments Among Straussian Readers of Augustine. Leo Strauss had far more to say about Islamic and Jewish medieval political philosophy than he did about Christian medieval political philosophy. And indeed, his very interest in and even enthusiasm for the former constitutes an implicit criticism of the latter. That his work has come to be read with such interest in Christian circles is thus in itself perhaps rather surprising. Ernest Fortin is often credited for starting the movement of Christian scholars reading Strauss. Fortin himself credited Alan Bloom's profligacy for jumpstarting his interest in Strauss. The two were both attending a course on Plato's laws at the Sorbonne and came to be friends since they were the only Americans in the class. Bloom, however, was often broke, so Fortin, who was modestly supported financially by his religious order, bought Bloom's copies of Strauss's books from him and began to read. What else is there to say but that God works in mysterious ways? Actually, though, I think that Fortin, while not divine, uh, denying divine providence, would ask a more down-to-earth question about this matter of Christians reading Strauss. What is it about Strauss's writings that has been and remains so attractive to American Christian scholars, or at least to a subset of them? What did Christian medieval scholarship need that was specifically present in Strauss's work? Strauss generally followed <clears throat> the not unreasonable practice of locating philosophy in the medieval Christian world principally within the then new Christian universities of Europe. As in modern times though, <clears throat> Strauss noted that in the middle ages, philosophy and universities were not especially good for each other. The Christian universities invited philosophy into their midst, but the price of admission, at least in Strauss's view, was that philosophy had to become the handmaid to Christian revealed theology. These Christian schools gave rise to scholasticism, which Strauss judged to have fudged the distinction between philosophy and revealed theology. Rather than a path of discovery that led one knew not where, philosophy became predictable and well-trodden. The scholastics always wrote with a formal question at the top of the page, but they knew the answer to be reached before they even started. 
Within scholasticism, the doctrine most relevant to political philosophy was that of natural law. But the doctrine of natural law was not really natural or philosophical, according to Strauss, but a strange hybrid into which Christian revelation had been smuggled. The scholastic author with the greatest reputation in Strauss' time was Thomas Aquinas. But Thomas did not preserve political philosophy as faithfully as Al-Farabi or Maimonides. Strauss did display some interest in a minority movement in the Christian world, a movement now termed Latin Averroism. In fact, the only medieval Christian author Strauss wrote on in a sustained manner was Marsilius of Padua, whom Strauss interpreted as being a sort of Averroist. Thus, Strauss's project argues for at least three notions with respect to medieval Christian political philosophy. One, overcoming scholasticism. Two, rejecting natural law teaching. And three, respecting Latin averroism. How have these aspects of Strauss's teachings fared within the larger world of medieval scholarship in our times? We will take the three matters in reverse order. With respect to Latin averroism, it is fair to say <clears throat> that Strauss's essay on Mercilius caused something of a minor stir among early Reformation scholars who were previously the main readers of Marsilius. Traditionally, Marsilius is linked to a reform movement in the Christian church known as conciliarism and whose principal intellectual proponent was John Wycliffe. Strauss's interpretation of Marsilius as something of an Averroist would understandably draw attention. After all, if Marsilius really were an Averroist, what might that say about Wycliffe or conciliarism as a whole? That said, the stir Strauss caused remains minor within Reformation worship. His essay is still studied by Straussians, of course, but probably more to understand Strauss than Marsilius. Strauss's concern with Latin Averroism, however, received a major impetus with Ernest Fortin's extension of Strauss's interests into the writings of Dante. Certain serious Dante scholars had always suspected that there was something fishy about the Florentine. After all, he cites Averroes by name in the beginning of the De Monarchia. Fortin sketched a more complete interpretation of Dante, however, namely that the Commedia itself has an esoteric and Averroistic message. This understanding of Dante as an Averroist cannot be said to be the majority view among scholars in our time, but it has caught on to such an extent that today it is a serious part of Dante scholarship. I would also like to <clears throat> allude to certain recent developments regarding the figure of Albert the Great, who was usually known simply as the teacher of Thomas Aquinas. Albert was also an important political thinker in his own right, having composed the first complete commentary on Aristotle's politics, and a massive commentary on the Nicomachean ethics that is often cited as the best medieval commentary on the subject that has come down to us. Manuscripts of Albert's earlier disputed questions at the University of Paris, moreover, have been published in critical editions that reveal his daring originality. Albert begins his politics commentary with an important reference to Farabi and his project to completely reform the schools of the Dominican order with a radical Aristotelian curriculum is simply breathtaking. And even some now non-Straussian scholars are beginning to talk of Albert's Averroism or Farabianism. In some then, with respect to Averroism, it seems to me that Strauss's assessment of Mercilius has hardly become common but that Fortin's assessment of Dante has a minority of advocates on side and is graining, gaining ground. What will happen with respect to the possibility of Albertus Magnus 
doctor of the Catholic Church and teacher of one of its most esteemed intellectual saints, being viewed as an Averroist is still completely up in the air. Secondly, what about natural law? Strauss's notion that Thomas Aquinas smuggles revelation into this supposedly natural and philosophical doctrine was expanded first by Strauss's student, Harry V. Jaffa, who is a legend among the denizens of the Claremont Institute. His dissertation published as the book Thomism and Aristotelianism. At the time of the publication of Jaffa's book, the Christian world, and especially the Catholic world, still contained a great many medieval scholars trained in Thomas and Thomism, and few of them were very sympathetic to Jaffa's thesis. The matter is on how to read a passage from six of the Nicomachean ethics that is quite obscure, and Jaffa's account came across to them as improbable. As a result, Strauss's criticisms of Christian medieval natural law thinking got off to a slow start, but later picked up momentum. Today, Thomistic natural law is largely confined to a now rapidly shrinking world of Catholic scholarship. The Straussian criticisms, moreover, are making greater headway and are at least part of that discussion. Particularly relevant now is the question of conscience. Thomas seems to assert not only that the natural law exists, but that we all know it through the dictates of conscience. This has begun to appear as a difficult proposition to establish or even defend. It is one thing to assert with Strauss that there exists a hierarchy of natural ends to which human beings are drawn. It is quite another to insist that we are all sufficiently outside of the cave so that we recognize these ends as well as a divinely sanctioned obligation to attain them. Stay tuned, but it seems that a full-blown natural law theory is in retreat in many locations if it is understood as a purely philosophical position. And Straussian type criticisms are front and center against it, although the name of Strauss is not always attached. Indeed, some non-Straussian criticisms of natural law probably go too far now in that the very idea of nature providing any sort of guide for human behavior is advancing much more rapidly than the arguments warrant. The Straussians have asserted persuasively, in my view, that what is just by nature is not actually natural law unless theological notions from biblical revelation are smuggled in. From the assertion, from that assertion, it hardly follows though, that there is no philosophical argument to be made for the just by nature. The enemy of one's enemy is not always one's friend. And by this point, one wonders if it's still prudent for Straussians to criticize openly what is left of natural law thinking. This brings us to the matter of scholasticism and especially to the scholastic understanding of the relationship between philosophy and revealed or sacred or dialectical theology. That is to say, theology that understands its premises and points to include trans rational assertions. This is probably the most fundamental of the three Straussian criticisms. The debate surrounding it intense, but only among a rather narrow range of scholars. Protestant Christian scholars not to be overly impressed with foreign philosophy anyway, so attempt to uh, separate philosophy and exile it from theology are generally well received among them. On the other hand, from the side of philosophy, it is only the relatively small subset of philosophers with Christian longings who find the proposed divorce between philosophy and Christianity upsetting anyway. It is thus a rather small group of scholars who are left to keep company with this most important question about faith and reason. 
The result is that the Straussian criticism of scholasticism on the relationship between theology and philosophy has shown itself to be most hotly debated among the Catholic Christians. Now, in criticizing scholasticism, natural law, and the notion of a serene and peaceful relationship between reason and faith, Strauss was obviously criticizing principally Thomas Aquinas. This has had the effect, presumably unintended, of pushing Straussians working within a Christian context toward that other famous intellectual pillar of Christianity, namely Augustine. Once again, the pioneer of this movement was Ernest Fortin, but the movement has been advanced considerably by Fortin's students and by their students. It is strangely enough within Augustinian scholarship that Strauss's writings may ultimately cast their longest shadow among Christians. What are these Straussian influences that I am pointing to? We can begin simply enough with the reading techniques that have come to be applied to the study of Augustine. Straussians teach us, if they teach us anything at all, that a dialogue is different from a treatise. Nevertheless, beginning students of Augustine, including this one when younger, initiated into Augustine with collections that placed a snippet from a dialogue right next to a snippet from a treatise or to a snippet from a polemical or rhetorical work. <clears throat> Augustine wrote a great many dialogues, but to understand dialogues, just to read them properly, the influence of Strauss has been invaluable to Augustine scholars. Strauss also taught us to be extremely attentive to structure and order when reading great books to watch for the middle point, for example. He also taught us to consider carefully the rhetorical purposes of important authors. But Augustine commented extensively on Ciceronian rhetoric and massaged it into the new genre of the Christian sermon. In addition to their great attentiveness to reading techniques, Straussians who study Augustine have found it necessary to study with greater care his classical pagan sources. It was always known to Augustine scholars that Cicero was important to them, but post-Reformation study of Augustine did not attend much to this point. The Reformation Christians, or at least most of those subsequent to Calvin himself, were not much interested in Ciceronian philosophy. Classical scholars, likewise, came not to be much interested in Christians like Augustine. Strauss, however, indirectly guided readers of Augustine precisely toward Augustine's encounter with Cicero. But new attentiveness to Augustine's encounter with Cicero leads us back to Augustine's encounter with Platonism. Augustine scholarship in much or most of the 20th century was obsessed with the question of Augustine's alleged indebtedness to what is known in our age as Neoplatonism. These endless debates among Augustine scholars focused almost exclusively on lines of influence regarding metaphysics, epistemology, and cosmology. Did Augustine get this or that metaphysical notion from Porphyry, or was it from Plotinus? As breathtaking as those intellectual battles were, Straussians reading Augustine have begun to notice that he knows far more about Platonic political philosophy than we had heretofore realized. Even the famous Strauss doctrine of esotericism is easily discovered in Augustine. That is, Augustine makes it crystal clear that he came to realize that the Platonists practiced esotericism to protect their ideas from people too base to understand them properly. It is now even clear that Augustine used this idea of communicating to multiple audiences within a single text 
for his understanding of the distinction between the literal and figurative meanings of the Bible. But what about the role of Augustine in Strauss's general narrative of medieval political philosophy? How does this new reading of Augustine affect the bigger picture? It is not yet clear where Straussian-based Augustinianism will wind up, but conjectures can be made. Strauss is famous for recovering Al-Farabi as the first to reflect extensively on how to practice ancient political philosophy within the new context created by the great revealed religions of the West. If the interpretation of Augustine emerging from this recent scholarship proves to be accurate. It turns out that Augustine understood the problem posed by Al-Farabi well and reflected profoundly upon it and did so centuries earlier. Augustine was not, of course, in the end, a true philosopher in the Straussian sense. His final position can, be haps, can perhaps be said to be more like Al-Ghazali than Al-Farabi. But he understood philosophers much better than Augustinian scholars previously thought he did. He knows what they can contribute to the pursuit of truth, but knows where their weakness lie as well. He preserves the tension between philosophy and theology and almost revels in it. Thus, while it is not yet clear how this story of Straussian inspired reflections on Augustine will end, already one sees Straussian insight brought to bear that are surely altering perspectives on Augustine among Christian scholars. And that might eventually even lead to altered narratives of medieval political philosophy among Straussians as well. Thank you. Um, okay, so now we have uh, two sets of comments. Uh, the first by Karen Talia Farrell and the second by Mary Keyes. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, and forgive me, I'm just navigating over to my comments here. And uh, thanks for the invitation, of course, to Douglas and, and Josh, perhaps for organizing this. I can't even recall now back to the beginning. Um, and certainly to the Claremont Institute for hosting, for giving us a, a home after being kicked out of our initial one. Um, and certainly thanks as well to uh, Rasul and to Josh for such excellent papers and for giving me the opportunity to think about these. My apologies, <clears throat> my apologies for my voice, which I managed to lose just last night, rather out of the blue. So hopefully you can um, understand me. And if not, I guess I'm not looking at the Zoom screen, so I won't know, um, but I'll do my best. So first for uh, Russell's paper. So Russell Namazi provides a lucid, insightful, and at least to me, certainly very helpful review of exemplars of scholarship critical of Leo Strauss's work on Arabic and Islamic philosophy. Professor Namazi addresses a great number of these criticisms with carefully reasoned rejoinders, but I can address only a little bit of this in our short time. So I'm going to focus in these comments on his treatment of Dimitri Gutas's um, critique or charge, I should say really, of Orientalism against Strauss. As I understood uh, Professor Namazi's paper, Gutas charges Strauss with a subterranean Orientalism, one that is particularly vibrant in Strauss's political approach to Islamic philosophy. Um, since the political approach for Gutas is also a problem among historians of Arabic philosophy, Strauss is guilty of at least two scholarly sins in one. It sounds from your, from your presentation, Russell, that it is actually all three sins in one. Um, he is also guilty of the, the mystical charge, importing too much religion. More concretely, Gutas charges Strauss with being, quote, invariably, <clears throat> excuse me, concerned with the conflict of religion and philosophy, which is a charge that Namazi disputes. As, as he writes, Strauss never claimed that, and Gutas adduces no evidence that he did, end quote. Namazi writes, furthermore, that Gutas had to use such hyperbolic language, invariable and all of, et cetera, because, quote, his claim would become moot if he had said it in more qualified terms. Um, but would it really? 
that is, while it is surely the case that Strauss indeed never claimed explicitly that all of Islamic philosophy was about the conflict of religion and philosophy, nor wrote as if that were genuinely the case, I think perhaps there could be evidence for a more qualified version of Gotas's claim that would not be moot necessarily. Um, it might call into question Strauss's approach to Islamic philosophy if for, in, if, for instance, Strauss looked at most of Islamic philosophy through that lens, if that were not justified, or even looked at an, um, an unfair number of texts in this way. Of course, one would have to supply the criterion for this. Nevertheless, it seems possible that there could be an imbalanced approach, even if he didn't approach everything with the, the lens of uh, the conflict of religion and philosophy. If so, then perhaps he might be guilty of the very Orientalism Gutas is concerned with. I will address this idea of Orientalism in just a moment. <clears throat> but secondly, um, both Gutas and Oliver Lehman, who I don't believe you addressed in the presentation itself, but appears in the, the larger paper, both Gutas and Lehman charge Strauss with Orientalism also because his esoteric approach to Islamic philosophy shows, in their view, that Strauss viewed Islamic philosophy differently from how he viewed Western philosophy. Namazi answers that Strauss was also concerned with this same religion and philosophy question, this tension or conflict, in the Western context. So this charge of Orientalism makes no sense. How can he be concerned with exactly the same issue in both the Western and Islamic and Jew Jewish? Um, case, and, and yet it is an offense in one case and not in the other. Here again, I'm not sure that uh, Namazi's answer might satisfy Lehman or Gotas if we, if we consider Edward Said's definition, actually his second definition of Orientalism, which is, uh, this is a quote, a style of thought based upon an ontological and epistemological distinction made between the Orient, in scare quotes, and of the time, quotes, the Occident. <clears throat> if we consider that definition, that there is some sort of, that there is a, 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 a crime of Orientalism in finding this ontological and epistemological distinction between the Orient and the Occident. Um, and then if we can find obvious support for this issue of religion and philosophy or reason and revelation in, say, Aquinas, but we have to take an esoteric approach to find it in Arabic and Islamic philosophy, um, is this not then open to such a charge of Orientalism, i.e. is not Strauss actually treating the Orient and the Occident differently? Um, so I, I wonder if it might not be more productive, although this is perhaps a both and issue, rather to simply ask what it is that Lehman and Guthas fundamentally object to in Strauss's esoteric approach. Even if his approach to these texts does betray a Western way of thinking an ori or an Orientalism, which of course they would term a bias, surely one should address the substance and not only the motivation or mindset behind Strauss's readings of these texts. Um, I think we could also address the grossly overdetermined nature of Said's um, pivotal definitions of three definitions of Orientalism which seem to encompass anything anyone who is not from the Orient says about the Orient, even though the Orient cannot be defined because in the idea of Orientalism is this objection to an epistemological or ontological distinction between the Orient and the Occident. Um, so it, it's, it's not quite clear how one can avoid the charge in the first place. In other words, if the objective is to understand a text or an idea, are not all tools on the table, even if that means having an approach that is provincially Western, provincially Occidental. To borrow from Averroes, one can make a valid Islamic sacrifice without worrying if the tool was made by a Muslim. Um, <clears throat> I'll end here by noting, as my time is quite short, that I was pleased to hear the addition, Rasul, of your comments on the reasons to continue to read Strauss on Arabic philosophy in the 21st century among them the influence of the Islamic philosophers on Strauss's interpretation of Plato. Um, considering the vast proliferation of Islamic studies since Strauss's time, I think that scholarship such as Professor Namazi's is essential for pointing out Strauss's unique contribution in his textual and interpretive approach. In short, as you point out, Russell, uh, Strauss takes thinkers on their own and in their best terms, which I, I think is an approach that is often lacking in the academy today, um, but happily on full display here. Um, I did have just one question for you, Rasul, and it's 
it's perhaps not even a fair question, but you made a, a note of um, objecting, I think, to <clears throat> some of Strauss's critics approach, what I think is a philological approach, um, criticizing Strauss for ignoring the, um, the, the availability of Greek terms or lack thereof for the Arabic and Islamic philosophers. Um, in short, ignoring the philological approach. And I'm wondering if this is, again, a both and question, right? Surely these texts can be approached philosophically, which I understood you to be advocating and to be um, approving of Strauss's approach in that regard. Um, one wonders if in doing so, it, one is not also obligated to understand, at least to some extent, the, the sources themselves that they had. But I'd be, I'd be interested to, to hear your thoughts on that if there's time. Um, now, one moment. Am I meant then to go directly on to comments on Josh's paper? Yes, okay. All right, well, that is uh, regrettably where I'll have to leave that on, on uh, Russell's really excellent paper that I enjoyed so much, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And now to Professor Perrins's paper. Joshua Perrins begins with the query, begins his paper with the query, why is Maimonides relevant for students of political philosophy? He ends by asserting the guide of the perplexed is in fact a work of political philosophy rather than a work of Jewish philosophy. The rationale in between these two statements or question and statement, for the rationale for this comes as I understand it from Perrins' judgment with Strauss that Maimonides was interested more in a defense of the law or Judaism than in the legal foundation of philosophy. Again, a defense of the law or Judaism, these are quotes, than in the legal foundation of philosophy. Of course, for the latter, one would look, as did Strauss, to have been rushed uh, to a very decisive treatise, which does indeed provide a defense of philosophy by pointing to the law. <coughs> Excuse me. But if the guide is a work of political philosophy, and if Maimonides is more interested in a defense of Judaism, then we must answer how a defense of Judaism, as I think Professor Barron's raises, we must answer how a defense of Judaism, of a revealed religion with a divinely given law, can itself be an act of political philosophy. That is, it is perhaps clear how it can be political because it concerns law and the ordering of society, of, of the Jewish society. But how is it philosophy? To expand on this question, is the Judaism that Perrins reads in Maimonides, which is the Judaism that Strauss is defending on Perrins' reading in the literary guide of the, I'm sorry, in the literary character of the Guide of the Perplexed, is this Judaism ultimately a religion of the philosophers? <coughs> The answer to this, and perhaps the very question itself, reveals a dilemma. For either it is, it is a religion of philosophers, in which case we must ultimately ask why it is that Judaism should be taken more seriously than any other philosophy, Greek, for example. Or it is not the religion of the philosophers, in which case it is God's revelation to the Jewish people, it is a binding legal system and a normative tradition. But again, how is this philosophical? Right? And yet, I, if I understood it correctly, I believe um, your paper is asserting that it is a work of political philosophy. Perrin's writes of Strauss's insistence that Maimonides' guide is misunderstood if it is taken as a work of Jewish philosophy. Here he's citing persecution. Rather, uh, Professor Perrin's maintains with Strauss that it is necessary to take Maimonides' presentation of the guide as a defense of Judaism with the utmost seriousness. Presumably then the guide is an act of political philosophy because it provides quote, a legal justification of philosophy. In other words, again, if I understood correctly, the guide is making the political philosophical argument that in a Jewish society, philosophy is justified. I'm not confident that I've understood that point correctly, but um, that was what I read into it. The difficulty with maintaining this though is twofold. And as first, as Perrins points out, Strauss denies that Jew and philosopher are compatible in the introduction to persecution in the art of writing. Um, <clears throat> in this case, it is difficult to see how philosophy could in the final analysis be justified according to Jewish law. But this formulation is, it, it also smacks of a bootstrapping or maybe question begging problem. If the guide is at once a defense of the law as well as a legal justification of philosophy, these both being quotes, it is then the guide is defending the Judaism on which the justification of philosophy depends. 
Perrin sees Strauss, at least the mature Strauss, as distancing himself from the notion of foundations, as it's too Kantian, still, at least um, to this reader, it is difficult to see how to get around the problem of a foundation here, um, because it seems circular. Again, it's defending the Judaism, which itself provides the justification for philosophy. So how can this be a work of political philosophy? In answer to this, I believe, Perens leaves us with the tantalizing hint that, quote, the limits of knowledge will prove indispensable in determining how these two opposing aims, i.e. defending Judaism and defending philosophy, can be achieved in Maimonides' guide. But I'm not sure that he tells us how both aims were, in his reading or in his reading of Strauss, indeed achieved, um, nor quite what it would mean to achieve these two opposing aims of defending philosophy and defending Judaism. So I'd be eager to hear more concerning the limitations of human knowledge and how they can, as Professor Perens puts it, cut both ways, i.e. those limits of human knowledge can be deployed to defend the need for philosophy, as Pinas would have it in the article in question, um, but they can also be used to defend the need for law, capital L, law. One can readily see the case that, um, for the latter cut, right, that um, the limits of human knowledge would, def would, would suggest the need for revelation. We cannot know everything on our own, we must have revelation. Um, in defense of this very position, it's surely a plausible reason for Maimonides writing the guide. But how would the limitations of human knowledge lead one to defend philosophy? Um, again, it seems to me that perhaps an insistence that human knowledge is finite would tend more towards the rejection or at least skepticism of philosophy and its promise. If human knowledge is so finite, how can we actually rely on it in a philosophical sense? So that's my, my primary query. Um, I, and I haven't looked back, but I do have two uh, clarifying questions for Professor Perens as well. Um, one concerns uh, his under, Perens' understanding, that is, of science in the context of Kalam versus jurisprudence. I mean, you've written in page four in my version, writing uh, the philosophy and law, Strauss had come to understand that as a student of Al-Farabi, Maimonides thought of the sciences in light of the distinction between jurisprudence and Kalam or dialectical theology, not in terms of Christianity's view of theology as the queen of the sciences. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean here by how Maimonides thought of the sciences, right? So is it that it, it seems to me jurisprudence might be called a science, but Kalam is not a science, um, Kalam is theology. So if jurisprudence here is science and Kalam is theology and law is supreme in, uh, well, I suppose in Islam in the case of Al-Farabi or Judaism, then this would indeed be the opposite of Christianity in which theology would be supreme. But then on the next page, on page five, you, you write of, um, quote, the enlightened Kalam of Maimonides on the model of Al-Farabi that, that he, Maimonides, used to defend Judaism, this enlightened Kalam. This, you write, is what Strauss takes Maimonides to be referring to when, in the introduction to Part One of the Guide, he refers to the true science of the law. Um, so how would enlightened Kalam be the true science of the law? I confess here, I think I'm just not clear on, on the meaning. Um, it seems to me that Kalam would decidedly not be a science. It would be a, a, an apologetic art, perhaps. So that's one very large clarifying question. What does, um, what do you mean by science? Perhaps what does Strauss mean by science? And I suppose, what does Maimonides mean by science? Um, and also, and I'm sure there's not time for all of this at all, but um, I, I was curious to hear in what sense you take this to be about Judaism and philosophy rather than revelation and reason or religion and philosophy more generally? Is it about both, but more about Judaism or is it specifically only about Judaism? Um, is it equally about both? So any of these, certainly I would be interested in knowing, but um, there's so much to discuss in, in both papers. So thank you both so very much. Thank you, Karen. Um, now we have some comments by Mary Keyes. Okay, um, let me just join everybody in thanking uh, Joe Postel and everyone at Claremont for organizing and facilitating this panel and also to Douglas Kreese and, and everybody uh, for making this possible. I'm just sorry we can't be in person, but as 
uh, Russell pointed out at the beginning, uh, it's a lot better, <laughs> uh, a lot better than nothing. So we're very grateful to be here. Um, in his thoughtful and lively paper, Douglas Creese embarks from Ernest Fortin's work to ask, um, and here I paraphrase uh, pretty closely, what has been so attractive to American Christian scholars about Strauss's work? Uh, and secondly, what seems to be the narrative movement of Christians in their continued reading of Strauss? Uh, and in my reflections that are both on and embarking from uh, Professor Kreese's paper, I'd like to address these questions, uh, slightly rephrasing the second one. And uh, what I, I think of as perhaps broadening it, but it, it, Douglas can tell me if I'm changing his intent, which is changing it to, what has been the narrative movement of Straussian influence thinkers, Christians and others, in studying like classical and medieval Christian thought? Um, and I hope that by the end of my remarks, my, my reasons for that alteration might, might be um, more apparent. Uh, and in some ways, I think I'm both beginning from Douglas's remarks on Augustine and will be ending there. So uh, in, in terms of the question of what makes uh, Strauss, Strauss's writings and Straussian uh, teachers so, so attractive to many Christians, and here I include myself, uh, I think, as uh, Douglas just pointed out at the end, the, the education and careful, attentive reading of important philosophic texts is a key reason uh, that it's something uh, for which there's an affinity and, and a sense of a real need and that one can learn quite a bit from Leo Strauss and his students and his students' students on this important aspect of the intellectual life. Another reason is I think uh, also apparent in both Augustine and in Aquinas's, and here I'll argue for the scholastic disputed question that, uh, and here I, it also paraphrases Strauss, that the, the questions are more evident than the answers. And the key questions that Strauss and Straussian political thinkers have and philosophic thinkers have brought to the table are very similar to the key questions that come out of Thomistic, Augustinian or other schools of inquiry. Uh, what is the relationship between a good life uh, in philosophic or religious terms and the political life? Uh, what is the relationship between faith and reason? How can we seriously explore ethical dimensions of politics, their richness and their limits? So these are some of the reasons that I gleaned from Professor Kreitz's paper and, and elaborate on my own as to why there's this affinity and this, this interest. Um, in terms of the trajectory I'm, uh, and the narrative movement, uh, my main contribution that, that I, I hope will be have some value is to, to uh, add a, maybe a strand of it that wasn't included in the very thoughtful and, and um, sort of nuanced account of different aspects of Straussian and Christian political thought that Professor Kreese offers. Um, I'll begin here from this is from page two of, of Professor Kreese's paper that he based his comments very closely on. Professor Kreese writes, uh, Strauss's project argues for at least three necessary tasks for medieval Christian political philosophy, or I would edit it slightly, the fruitful study suggests the fruitful study of medieval Christian political philosophy. First, overcoming scholasticism. Second, rejecting natural law teaching. Uh, and third, respecting Latin Averroism. Uh, and I'd like to suggest, and I'd be really eager to hear Professor uh, Kreese's response, that there is a strand of, and, and I won't say a strand, but I'd say like clusters of Christian scholars who are interested in late classical and medieval Christian thought, uh, and who are influenced by Strauss and some of Strauss's students and writings, uh, that, uh, uh, let's say uh, that does not reject natural law teaching, number one. <laughs> number two, doesn't think scholasticism should be overcome, although it should be humanized, it should not be a unique approach, it should be one among many, but that scholasticism has uh, right, well understood, we can say, has, has something valuable to contribute. And, um, and that while we agree that respecting Latin Averroism and Averroism in general is, is important philosophically, respect need not be agree or, or um, concur with in some important respects. So, um, and, 
I'd like to start here uh, from uh, as here or, or to continue here from Harry Jaffra's basically pathbreaking book um, on Straussian approaches to Aquinas in terms of uh, an elaborate writing on the subject, Thomism and Aristotelianism. Uh, and um, so as Professor Kreese told us in his, in his paper and elaborated in his remarks, uh, Professor Jaffa, in, in this early work that grew out of his dissertation, I understand he later modified some of his views on Aquinas and, and um, the reason, relation between reason and revelation. But certainly in this, in this early work, uh, he argues that Aquinas's commentaries on Aristotle, and, and he takes this very seriously and positively, Strauss has similar statements, at, at least uh, I'm hoping I'm remembering correctly, but that Aquinas's Aristotelian commentaries are close readings of the text, here I'm paraphrasing, they aim at interpretation at getting Aristotle right and they show that Aquinas took Aristotle and philosophy very seriously. Uh, although then the criticism will be made that he imports Christian revealed truth in such a way as to fudge or muddle, uh, so you could say true philosophic insight. And one example of that is morphing Aristotle's natural right into a full blown natural law teaching. Um, and on my reading, and this is one area in which uh, I've tried to uh, engage and to, uh, to challenge Jaffa's thesis, that on my reading, yes, Aquinas's Aristotelian commentaries, are, they are certainly trying to understand Aristotle and, and trying to see what arguments he brings to the table to take them seriously in their own right. But I would argue that they go beyond this, that Aquinas's Aristotelian commentaries and here I'm building on the work of John Jenkins, who's a colleague in philosophy, not a Straussian, and who's been the president of my university for quite a while now. But before that, he, he wrote a lot about Aquinas and has an article called Explications of the Text, Aquinas' Aristotelian Commentaries, uh, which helped crystallize a lot of things I thought I was seeing in Aquinas' commentaries that I didn't find reflected in Jaffa's analysis of them. Um, and he argues that Aquinas' Even the commentaries that are called sentenciae, which include that on the Nicomachean ethics, very close textual, very close readings of the text, that they're philosophic dialectical engagements, that Aquinas is always seeking truth, not simply Aristotle. And here I paraphrase Aquinas's critique of an Averroist reading, that it, we're not just looking for Aristotle. We're looking for truth as we try to read Aristotle and learn from him. And that will sometimes involve going beyond Aristotle or even rejecting some of Aristotle. Second, uh, Jenkins argues that Aquinas, here I think you, one might say Christianizes or in a broad Judeo-Christian sense as well, that Aristotle's approach of trying to save the appearances, trying to look for giving, uh, and, and Jenkins' term is a hum hermeneutic of charity, that Aquinas will try to read each text. And if, if an interpretation is doubtful, he's gonna give the interpretation he considers closest to the truth. So this does make reading Aquinas' commentaries more difficult and more complex, but I, for various reasons, I think that it is a better understanding of what Aquinas is doing in those commentaries. Uh, and um, that as Jenkins argues, and, and I concur, it. It, gives, it helps us make more sense out of contradictions, things that apparently do not make sense in Aquinas' commentaries and vis-a-vis -vis his commentaries and, and incorporation of Aristotle, for example, into the Summa. Um, so on that account, I at least try to argue that Aquinas' account of natural law is, and I'm far from the only one, is, is more plausible than, is, than it is, uh, philosophically plausible than is, is, um, is considered the case by other Straussian readers. Then um, I'll say too, I just want to comment, just call attention to a few articles that I think could be helpful for people maybe wanting to explore these Straussian inspired, but perhaps in important respects, not simply Straussian readings of Aquinas, Augustine and other Christian thinkers. Uh, one is by Michael Zuckert, so not a Christian uh, and uh, not, not a Thomist, who has an article that I think is really, really good on Aquinas' natural law theory. It's called Fullness of Being. Fullness of Being, um, Thomas Aquinas and Modern Critics of Natural Law. 
And in that article, Zucker takes Aquinas and his natural thinking on natural law philosophically extremely seriously. He argues that Aquinas has resources to respond to many modern critiques of his natural law, philosophic critiques of his natural law theory, even if Zuckert isn't fully persuaded and is left with more questions at the end. Uh, so that I think is one example of a sort of a, a modification or a development of Straussian approaches to Christian political thought. Uh, that again, with all the literature out there, Professor Kreese could not incorporate all of it and, and should not have tried. So, uh, and then uh, there's another piece by Fred Crossan, Esoteric versus Latent Teaching, that I think is, is extremely good. Um, and lastly, I'll finish though with one of Douglas Kreese's own papers, uh, articles, which, which I consider, uh, Alistair McIntyre once described Thomism and Aristotelianism as a minor modern classic. And, and I think of this article by Professor Kreese as a minor modern classic and, and a real uh, a seminal moment in modern approaches to studying Aquinas' political thought. And it's like, uh, like Thomism and Aristotelianism, it's an early work of, of Professor Kreese in this case. It's an article entitled Thomas Aquinas and the Politics of Moses. Um, and in that article, um, and I'll just read a couple of passages from it and then just raise a few questions uh, for Professor Kreese. He comments on Aquinas, and here we go back to, you know, our, our faith and reason necessary either or um, in, in one's approach. Um, and here in the introduction to this paper, which studies uh, Aquinas both on Aristotle and on the Mosaic uh, pre precepts about uh, the way political life should work in, in, the, in the land of in Israel. Kreese writes, the choice, however, is not simply either or. As a political thinker, a believer must come to grips with political philosophy. As a believer, a political thinker must come to grips with the Torah. Such is basically the problem which confronted Thomas Aquinas. Um, at the end of that article, Professor Kreese concludes, uh, most importantly, here he's speaking of Aquinas on the judicial precepts of the Mosaic law. Most importantly, since they properly take into consideration that aspect of justice, which orders human beings to God in regulating, excuse me, uh, in regulating that aspect of justice, which orders human beings to each other, the judicial precepts of the Mosaic law constitute the master exemplar of political wisdom to which all human political thinkers, including Christian political thinkers, must aspire. And so um, with that, I'd, I'd just like to raise a, a few con concluding questions. Um, and so um, one of them is, so for Professor Kreese, um, I'm wondering if you, so how to say it, does, does citing Averroes and referring to Averroes with respect or Al-Farabi for that matter, make one, uh, you could say a Latin Averroist. So I was, I was a little, um, I think of Aquinas who speaks of Averroes as the commentator in the same way he speaks of Aqu Aristotle as the philosopher, right? Uh, or a, a Paul as the apostle, as saying he's an amazing commentator. <laughs> And you see that even in Aquinas' work. So I, the, the thrust of your paper towards, for example, uh, leaving Albert the Great as a Latin Averroist, I, I wasn't sure I followed, just that he takes Aristotle very seriously and he takes Averroes or Al-Farabi in his case uh, very seriously. Uh, what, what should we make of that? Is it perhaps too quick to, to put them together in that, in that camp? Secondly, you, you comment in a footnote that Strauss did lecture on Augustine, and here this simply reflects my ignorance, but are any of those published, are his lecture notes available? Would it be really, I think it could be extremely interesting to explore that, and I haven't read any article, for example, on Strauss on Augustine and his teaching. Uh, and um, lastly, I've, and uh, in, at the end of your paper, Professor Kreese, you uh, you rightly, I think, describe how interesting Augustine is and how he's so aware of a classical philosophical life, including esotericism. And you write, most significantly, Augustine preserves the tension between philosophy and theology and almost revels in it. Um, and here, just in the context of our whole panel, I think of the, the quote that's been given a, a few times or mentioned that um, uh, 
that uh, for Strauss, one could only be, one could either be a Jew or one could be a philosopher, at least in some of his writings. But Augustine's quite clear that you can be both as a Christian and in the city of God, for example. So I, I wonder if his, if his if reveling in the tension is, is the best description of, of Augustine. He's certainly comfortable and at home with it in his late classical world. And yet I think he thinks that can be, if not done away with, which I doubt, <laughs> or, uh, in, overcome when he writes that uh, when a philosopher becomes a Christian, he or she doesn't need to change the way of life that they lead, that a philosophic way of life, and this is in book chapter 19 of book 19 of the City of God, that a philosophic life is compatible with professing Christian faith. So um, thank you, though, for a very, very, uh, yeah, very uh, thought-provoking and helpful paper. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Mary. That's uh, very good. Um, the only thing I'll say uh, very quickly is that um, indeed the Strauss archives includes a couple of lectures that Strauss gave on the city of God, <clears throat> a couple of class uh, transcripts. Um, I've looked at them, um, so they are available. Uh, and I'm told that uh, Fortin said that Strauss said that Augustine was just way too pessimistic uh, for his tastes. Okay, at this point, um, see, there's always a chair never knows what to do. There's only so much time left. Uh, we could try to let the uh, panelists uh, address the questions that have been posed, but you also feel, the chair also feels that we should uh, permit people who have watched uh, to pose questions. And so there's a button here. I'm not sure what's gonna happen, but I'm gonna click this button that says Q and A. Um, so supposedly uh, people can uh, pose questions uh, if they'd like. Now, I'm not seeing any questions uh, coming up. All right. Oh, okay. So uh, what I'm going to do then is uh, go back to Rasul since uh, he's farthest away uh, from us and, and let him uh, try to say something in uh, response to uh, Karen's uh, suggestions. So Doug, I, I yeah. don't know whether it makes a difference, but uh, Svetozar, Svetozar Minkov did raise his hand. Yes. Oh, he did. Okay, so I did never see that. Um, okay. And he let Fred get to. Um, oh, no, he doesn't okay. 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 You want me to, have... to ask his question? Yeah, do yeah you could you have Svetozar? Yeah. Uh, Okay. Hello. Well, I guess I, I think I'm maybe I'm I'm muted, but not un unshielded, uncovered. We can hear you. I can hear you. All right, that's good. Yeah, I, that maybe doesn't make a difference, Mr. Um, no, I uh, just wanted to ask about our Razi, but I mean, I have many opportunities to ask Rasul. This is such a great panel. This is too bad. It's almost it's almost over. We can probably talk for many hours. Um, uh, but uh, it, it, it looks like Strauss talks less and less about Arabic stuff as the decades go. And one possibility is that Krauss died, one possible explanation. And he does mention, but he does mention um, Krauss and Al-Razi in, in the Socrates and Aristophanes book. So, and, do, so do you have something to say about uh, what Al-Razi stands for? And uh, yeah, for, for Strauss. That's, that's okay. the question to you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this question. I, I don't know if I can answer it properly. I mean, you mentioned the, the obvious answer that comes to your mind when talking about the Strauss's uh, decreasing interest in uh, Islamic thought, at least in his writings, not in his manuscripts. He has much more uh, 
um, published unpublished material that he talks about Islamic thought, but he didn't really discuss anything in detail. So one reason uh, certainly was because Krauss passed away, and I think Strauss was generally very uncomfortable um, uh, to talk about Islamic subjects uh, without collaboration of a established Arabist. Although I claim that I think, and he said in one of his uh, job applications, by the way, that he could be Arabic, but um, certainly he wasn't very comfortable doing that without somebody who is expert on Islamic uh, matters. So that's one reason. But at the same time, you mentioned correctly that he refers to Al Razi, which, by the way, is through Krauss, because Krauss was really the person who rehabilitated Al Razi in the 20th century. Uh, he discovered most of the manuscripts, but he passed away, so uh, um, not many people followed his footsteps. Uh, some other people in recent years, as you know, uh, have worked on that policy, uh, publishing interesting uh, material. But uh, yes, that's very curious. It seems that he cared mostly about uh, this question of Socratic term in Al-Razi that Al-Razi shared this Socratic turn, that he cared so much about the uh, change of relationship of uh, Socrates with, with the city. Um, that, that's uh, what I can understand from this reference to Al-Razi, which is quite obvious. I mean, this is not a discovery or anything, uh, but uh, that's all I have to say. I'm sorry. Thank you. No, no. And that text is, by the way, translated by our very good friend, Professor Charles Butterworth, uh, the text by uh, Grazi, who talks about Socrates' Socratic term. Doug, how much time do we actually have, by the way? Well, I think we're supposed to be over at half past. Um, um, I don't know if it's our tech administrator there. <laughs> Um, yes, so that's you were supposed to end about six minutes ago. So, okay. Yeah. Um, are there any other uh, <clears throat> people in the audience who have raised their hands to ask a question? I, I don't seem to be able to see that. No, not there. at this point. Not at this point. Oh wait, we have we have one. Terry Clavin. Yeah. Terry. Oh, Terry. Yeah, he okay. keeps moving around depending. Okay. On well, Terry, if I'm right, is in Jordan right now, and. Uh, uh, if we could, could we take you, this one more question before we stop? Can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can. So I don't know who to address this question to. I think it pertains to what you all said. I mean, one of the concerns with the scholastic tradition was that they were reading one set of commentaries on Aristotle's works and, and not reading others. And the, the dominant figure tended to be uh, Avicenna and they were filtering Aristotle through Avicenna. Is that not correct? And, and I think what Strauss was discovering is that there's this other tradition of Aristotle that was Al-Farabi, Ibn Baja, Ibn Rushd, and it had not been understood in Latin scholasticism for the most part. And therefore, even in the critiques of the 17th century and Descartes and so on of scholasticism, they were, they were only critiquing, uh, you know, basically an Avicennian view of Aristotle and not, and not the, the other dominant tradition that had been so important in Strauss's discovery of what Plato and Aristotle were actually about. So isn't, isn't that something of the concern um, that the scholastics are too dominated by Avicenna and, and that clouded the, uh, the ability to see what Plato and Aristotle were really doing. Karen, you're muted. You're, you're muted still, Karen. I actually wasn't saying anything. That was me reading the Q&A very visually. <laughs> yes, speaking of which, Doug, you should note there is a Q&A for you yes. from, from Paul Hervé Tenel. So um, about Avicenna, I mean, I. I, I don't know if Rasul really wants to jump in on this, but uh, forgive the the dull answer that I give about this. I mean, the the interest in the West, in Avicenna, and of Eroes both, is dictated by the fact that 
uh, Western philosophy understands itself primarily as theoretical philosophy and believes that the proper way to think about philosophy is that one sets down metaphysical foundations and builds a political philosophy on that. If Strauss teaches one thing, it is that that is not the, the appropriate way to approach political philosophy. Uh, he learned that from Al-Farabi and Al-Farabi taught him how to read Plato correctly. Uh, so I think it's pretty natural that Al-Farabi dropped off the map and Avicenna is, is sort of the be all and end all along with Averroes. Do you want to address your chat thing, Doug? Oh, you're typing an answer. Okay. <laughs> Just speak your answer. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so uh, I, uh, uh, the, the answer was on the side. So I asked uh, Professor Connell to uh, send it to me to my email address and I'd uh, answer it then. Um, I, I have a hard time doing one thing at once, let alone two uh, at once. Um, oh, did uh, uh, anyone else want to say anything uh, more in response to Professor Clevin? Uh, no? Okay. Uh, I, 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 that's a very interesting uh, question though, uh, Terry. I'm going to think about it um, uh, myself uh, and try to get and, back uh, to you. Yes, just just very, something very short that um, Professor sure. Clarence knows much better than me. Uh, in the West, obviously, the tradition, the religious tradition was mostly Christianity, and Christianity understands itself as a religion of faith. Obviously, it is not a religion of law, like uh, the case of uh, Judaism and Islam. So therefore, they had difficulty really with Platonic way of uh, thinking more um, in a more practical uh, and politics oriented fashion so, which was the other way around among jews and, uh, and muslims who cared much about platonic philosophy because plato talks all the time about law which was at the center of their religious tradition which is not the case in christianity at least that was the uh, that was the uh, explanation that you could see from uh, you could get from uh, Strauss, and he had this very nice depiction of this. He mentioned uh, you have seen this uh, school of Athens painting that you see Aristotle mm -hmm. and Plato holding two different books. Plato is holding Timaeus and Aristotle mm -hmm. ethics, and uh, Strauss says that if Muslim thinkers or Jewish thinkers wanted to paint it something similar, they would paint Plato holding laws and Aristotle probably holding metaphysics, so other way around completely. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, it's a nice um, example, it's the illustration of the difficulty and the question, but uh, obviously it is not the last word on the subject. Okay. Okay, well, <clears throat> I think we better bring this to a close. I want to uh, thank uh, all of the panelists uh, and I want to thank all of the uh, audience. Um, I do apologize for my inexpert inexpertise at manipulating the Zoom features, uh, but uh, it, uh, hopefully the, these conversations uh, will continue. So thank you to all and uh, uh, farewell for now.